At this rhythm, we are quickly running out of time, but I have to combine two other questions. It's your first time in a post-communist country. And I have two questions, one from Rok Punchuch, who says, Jordan, how should we, as young people, shape the society so that old communist regime will be recognized as bad? Because, as many, because many still regard it as positive. positive. And this is an anonymous one, also connected to this one. How do you comment nostalgia after communism in ex-communist countries? So, I'm going to return to a biblical story again. Um, it's a story that I'm going to talk about a lot in September, I hope, I'm, when I get to the Exodus story. So, you know, Moses leads his people out of a tyranny, right? So that's, the relevance of that story is obvious. And then, you think, well, you leave a tyranny and then things are better, but that isn't what happens. And this is a very useful thing to know about your life in general. You think, well, people could be enlightened. That's the theory. And so then there's a question. Well, one might be, well, maybe that's just a false theory and that enlightenment is not possible. But we'll leave that aside. We'll assume for the moment that it is possible, but that there is a barrier to it. And you might think, well, what could possibly be the barrier? Because being enlightened is obviously better than not being enlightened. And then the obvious answer would be that there's a serious barrier and the barrier is that you have to go down before you go up and you know this already in your life because you'll have your set of preconceptions whatever they happen to be and they're semi-functional and then you lay them out in the world and now and then you encounter a terrible error and they collapse and, and when they collapse well you're no longer constrained by your erroneous presuppositions but now you're nowhere, and that's even worse. And that's what happens to the Israelites, and that's why they're in the desert for 40 years after the tyranny collapses, right? And when they're in the desert, well, they turn to all sorts of false idols, because of course that's what people do when they're trying to replace a tyranny. It's like, well, it might be this, it might be the golden calf, right? It might be that, it might be this. They fragment and they fight. And then they look with nostalgia back onto the past when everything was hypothetically secure and solid. And that's human nature, to look with nostalgia to the past, even if it was a tyranny. You know, and now and then you learn something in your life that's painful. And before you've learned what the pain has to teach you, you could easily be nostalgic for the position you had before the bomb was dropped upon you. And then maybe when you recover, if you do, you look back and you think, well, that was an absolute catastrophe, all of that, but I'm very glad that I had the chance to go through it because I'm now more than I was. But the progress forward is descent into the underworld and then ascent and not just a linear line upward. And maybe you can mitigate that to some degree by accepting the terrible truth bit by bit when it, when it confronts you so that you don't have to have a complete catastrophe to learn something but it's still the case that you learn in pain and the consequence of that is that you're nostalgic for your ignorance and that's certainly what's happening in these sorts of situations that combined with a certain amount of historical ignorance and a nice additional dollop of malevolence and I suppose as well the lack of desire to accept responsibility for the alternative I would say, it's a reflection of what I mentioned previously, um, put your life together and make something better. That's the way to defeat nostalgia for the false past. And don't be so sure you can't do it. I have this program I'll tell you about very briefly because of the effects it's had that have been surprising to us because we've tested this empirically. It's called the Future Authoring Program and it's on a site called selfauthoring.com. And it's a program that is designed to help people make a plan for their life. And it's a fairly straightforward program in some sense, although not so much in others. I might say, well, what do you want to do with your life? And you think, oh my God, I can't answer that question. It's like, that's a, that's a big question. And so you don't know. Part of the problem is it's not a very good question. It's not differentiated enough. So if you ask yourself a question that's so large you can't answer it, well, then you should ask yourself a smaller question. And so, 
in this program, you're asked to do things. We tried to make it practical. It's like, okay, it's three to five years down the road, and you get to have what you need and want within reason, right? Assuming you're taking care of yourself within reason. Well, what might you want? How would you like your family interactions to be going? Siblings, parents? What about your intimate relationship? If you could have what you wanted and needed from that, just what would that look like, hypothetically? Your career or your job? Because those aren't the same thing. At least maybe you could have a job that is respectable and, and that constitutes a valid contribution to those around you and helps justify your position in society. And perhaps you could even have a career, you know, that has some intrinsic meaning independently of that. Your education, your, your resistance to the temptation of drugs and alcohol and the sorts of things that knock people off the track, your, your care for yourself mentally and physically, your use of time productively and in an engaging manner outside of work. You could have what you wanted. What would it be? Answer it. Guess if you have to. And then write for 20 minutes about what your life could be like if all of that manifested itself. And then do the reverse. Write about what your life would be like in three to five years if you let everything about you that isn't good have full sway and take you to your own little subdivision of hell. And, and people are pretty aware of that. Everyone knows. Everyone I've ever talked to has some real sense of how they would degenerate if they degenerated in their own particular way. Some people would become cruel. Some people would become homicidal. Some people would become alcoholic. Some people would end up on the street. Some people would drift into prostitution. People know where their weaknesses are likely to tempt them and take them. And so then you sketch out a little hell and a little heaven and Maybe you're motivated to run from the one, which is good, and to run toward the other. And, and so then you have a framework for your life. And then maybe you make a strategic plan. Well, we've, we've, we've done that now with thousands of people in, in, in Holland and in Canada, mostly university students, well, all university students in the research studies. And we found at this little college in Canada, Mohawk College, if you brought students in in the summer in their orientation and just had them do this program which should probably take you about five days if you did it thoroughly if you had it, had them do it really badly in an hour that that decreased the probability that the men would drop out in the first semester by 50% it was a staggering finding and we found the same we found findings of similar magnitude across the other studies and, and the reason I'm telling you this is because a lot of the reason that people don't get what they want is because they don't aim at it. There's this idea in the New Testament, if you knock, the door will open. You think, well, that's an unbelievably naively optimistic statement that no one in their right mind would possibly give any credence to. But the world is a very strange place. And it does, it is the case that your perceptions of the world and the personality that you inhabit orients itself around your fundamental goal. You're goal-directed creatures. You look forward. We point at everything. Like we're, we're arrows that are aimed at, at... We're either aimed at something or at nothing. But we have to be aimed. And if you aim at something, then the probability that something will come out of that is radically enhanced. And it might not even be what you aim at to begin with, but that's okay, because what do you know? Like you might be aiming wrong if you aim and then move forward your perspective will change and then maybe you can shift your aim and that's fine but at least you're moving forward say well the way out of the post-communist nostalgia is forward into the future that you want to create and then the future you want to create is the future that you create and and you might as well create it because you don't have anything better to do now, the other thing that's so important to realize and this is part of the issue with regards to fragility is you're all in on this game You've already staked your life on it. And so you, as far as I can tell, you might as well stake your life on something that you regard as worthwhile. Because you're staking your life anyways. And what's the alternative? You're going to stake your life on something you don't think is worthwhile? It's like, how is that an improvement? There's no improvement in that. And so if you want to plow a better pathway forward, then get out the plow and, and, start, and start working it. And that works way better than... It works way better than you would think. 
I've often wondered, and I think it's a reasonable thing to wonder, it's like, we're not doing too bad in this world, you know, things are a lot better than they were 50 years ago, and there's a lot of reason to be optimistic, and there's reason to be pessimistic, but you know, it's not like we're all in making things better. We're maybe 60-40 or 65-35 or something like that, each of us individually and then also collectively. You wonder what would happen if we were all in, just how much better we could make things. And there's something that's worth thinking about. There's something to devote yourself to. It's like, how much suffering could you rectify if that was your goal? Your own and other people's as well. And how much malevolence could you constrain? And what amount of good could you do in the world? That's a noble goal, and it's certainly something worth discovering, unless you have something better to do. And it doesn't seem to me that you do. So, well, especially when you think about good, as, not as something that's associated with naive adherence to a set of constraining rules, you know, that all good is is obedience. I'm, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm saying, look, there's problems that are out there in the world, and some of those problems bother you. They're your problems. Right? I don't know why they bother you and some other problems bother someone else, but there are problems that bother you. Those are your problems, right? That's your call to adventure. Solve them and see who you are and show everyone else. Well, and then they won't be nostalgic for the, the cold, dead hand of the, of the past.